It could be 11.30 at night. You've just finished. Uh, ah, 11.30. It could be 4 in the morning. You right. Know, it's okay. A, so 4 in the morning, let's say. <clears throat> and let's say Justin uh, Hollander is, uh, you know, he's, he's hit his limited craps. And he's like, look, and I, I've been schmoozing, you know, the uh, whoever's agent, and it's time to go. And then somebody goes, hey, just come get one more, uh, uh, you know, Zima with me. I know you're a big Zima guy, Justin. He goes, I'm actually not, but I'm, you know, when in Vegas. He's got some under his desk. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's got some under his desk. Look at the ice people. Happy Monday. Welcome back to the About Last Night podcast. How are you guys? Hope you had a great weekend. I was in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, home of bourbon and Johnny Depp and and uh, and Cincinnati is not too far from here. Or Chicago. There was a knife convention happening at my hotel. It happens every year. Somebody said, what kind of knives? Like cooking? I go, less Gordon Ramsay, more Duck Dynasty. Uh, hung out with some of the peeps. Uh, they were sweet. They love knives. There's a guy named Jeremy Marsh, I think. They said he's big in the knife world. Met him. Um, maybe he's cool in the knife world. Seemed like it. Seemed legit. Uh, sold a lot of knives they did bought a lot of knives people made knives there was some kid in the elevator I was like are you here for this seems like an adult thing he was like I like knives I was like what kind he's like oh tops of knives and uh, that was that shows are great comedy off Broadway shout out to all the killers Catherine uh, Mike Luke Nick John a bunch of killers great club comedy off Broadway Teresa and gang crushed it these guys know what they're doing go see and support that club uh, in a great little spot. They take care of you. They put you in a good spot so you can walk to the club. Went to their mall one day. That was fun. Uh, and Cincy uh, and Kentucky um, are cool spots. I flew into Cincy. I'm flying out there in a few hours. Um, but uh, anyway, great time. Thank you, everyone that came out. A lot of uh, ALN fans, a lot of Corolla fans. Uh, it was great. Can't wait to go back. A lot of crowd work clips coming, by the way. Holy fucking shit. Get ready. Get ready. Um, today's episode is a great episode it's uh with a guy i respect i admire he's uh fun as shit and he's uh responsible um uh for snapping the mariners my seattle mariners professional baseball team in seattle snapping their 20 plus year drought for making the postseason and uh we sat down at t-mobile park where the mariners play in the press box for almost 90 minutes, and it's fucking awesome. It's a part two conversation with Mariners, president of baseball operations, Jerry Depoto, former GM, helped and is helping and will continue to help construct and develop and build a championship squad. Uh, if you love baseball, and especially if you love the Mariners, you're going to love this uh, interview. Spliced together, just like the Sean Kemp episode with videos and pictures galore to kind of, kind of fill out and paint the picture of things we're talking about and referencing. Enjoy the hell out of this episode. Follow the Mariners at Seattle Mariners. Follow me at Adam Ray Comedy on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Alan Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Tour dates at AdamRayComedy.com. I am coming on the road to Snoqualmie Casino next weekend. This weekend, December 11th, Sunday, Snoqualmie Casino. Come out and see your boy. Can't wait. Hometown show, Snoqualmie Casino, December 11th in Snoqualmie at the casino. Uh, I believe the show is 7 p.m. Uh, and then the following weekend, I will be with Sal Volcano in Sacramento, San Jose, and Santa Rosa. Check SalVolcanoComedy.com for those tickets. December 22nd and 23rd, I'll be in Portland at Helium Comedy Club. Come out and see me. Three shows, Friday, Saturday, uh, AdamRayComedy.com for those tickets. And then, of course, New Year's, Vegas, the 29th of December through January 1st. Vegas, Tropicana, Laugh Factory. Can't wait. Love the room. Love the club. 2023 tour dates are stacking up. Tons. Tons of my own headlining dates and then some more with uh, Sal and Chris D'Elia, all at AdamRayComedy.com. Check those out. Come out and see me. Young Rock, Fridays on NBC. Welcome to Chippendales every Tuesday on Hulu. And uh, the merch, AdamRayComedy.com. Go get it. More fun stuff coming. Can't wait. Doing a lot of uh, content and podcasts this week. Can't wait for you guys to see it all. Enjoy your week. Uh, thanks for listening and enjoy this special episode of the About Last Night podcast with the Mariners GM, President of Baseball Operations, Jerry Depoto. Hey, it's Herbert. Mm-hmm. And you're listening to the About Last Night podcast, you slippery little son of a bitch.
Gooby is a, like a, he's dialed with Sorry, like a, Gooby, yeah. yeah. No, I call yeah. him Goobs. There's yeah. a, Goobs is a great nickname. For the longest time, my wife didn't know what his first name was. and uh, Because it was just Goobs. Yeah. Well, that brings me uh, to my first question. Do you have a nickname? Do people call you like Depotes or JD or um, Fountain of Youth? Some of these things. Yeah. Or Brad Pitt's Doppelganger. Definitely not. That's you said, nice. by the way, that you've never gotten or you don't get carded much anymore. But I have to assume there's uh is it like a running uh, i don't know joke within the organization of like oh yeah jerry does you know still gets carded for like that type of thing or is it not really, really? you know th- yeah. there's a it will be somewhat of a joke with my family because <laughs> my kids will laugh when someone you know in years past when someone would ask me for for an id right you know and i i share it with you i would tell them i i'm going to show you my id <laughs> but you're going to be embarrassed yeah. you know, like, uh, uh you now I'm sure people want to know the stars are just like us. Does Jerry Depoto go to the store and buy his own booze or do you send somebody out? Oh, no, I buy my own booze. <laughs> and I have some, a fair bit of it delivered as well. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, yeah. I mean, once Postmates or any sort of app delivery service came around, I was like, oh, this is going to be the end of me. And I'm not going to be able to pay for a kid to go to college because I wanted a Slurpee at 2 a.m. because I was high. Um, <laughs> Jerry Depoto back on the pod. You're the best. Set it up to do it. Uh, in uh, this beautiful spot. Does the view get old? I think I asked you this last time, but we weren't here. It, it never does. Actually, the, the thing I like best about being in season, outside of the obvious, which is you get to see a game every night, yeah. is that you know for the work day through the off season, our offices are across the hallway. During the season, I, can, I find an excuse to come over to this side of the, the hall at about you know eleven or noon, right after uh, nice. having lunch, yeah. and then just work the rest of the day looking out at the the field until it's time to go downstairs and and uh, and hang out by the the staff, players, etc. And even during most games, and I know you when we were uh, uh, texting um, mid season um, post last pod, uh, you were saying how many you know you're like oh I can't I was you know like I'm gonna be up in town there's a show if you want to go to or even down here, and you're like, no, I'm going to Anaheim, or I'm going to this. And then in town, you're like, I'm going to the game. You go to pretty much every home game, yeah? Every game, yeah. How many, like, road games will you try to hit? You know, you, there's, in, in my early years yeah. as a general manager, I would go to, to every road game. You know, it, it was just part of trying to build relationships, get to know everybody. Right. And, and uh, you know, in the time since now, I just, I, I tend to pick the cities I want to go to. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, Almost like the way Adam Sandler yeah. picks a location for a movie. D- D- like Africa would be cool. <laughs> that was the one I tried. That. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I, t- I tend to go to the same places year after year. Might might try something new, you know, in a given year. But mostly, it's my family. My extended family lives in Kansas City. Oh, nice. Uh, so I'll always go to Kansas City. Get some BBQ. Yeah. We never don't go to New York when it's time to play the Yankees or the Mets. Right. Never don't go to Boston, with the exception being. If those trips fall in conjunction with our draft, then, you know, the draft is a it's a very unique thing for all sports. And I I imagine it's more complex for baseball than any of them because our our draft is so much longer than than the other leagues. And it might be the draft that most sports fans know the least about. Yeah. Including the people who actually execute. (laughs) There's and I say this, we've we've done well in this space, but. You know, when I started working in baseball operations, the draft was 50 rounds long. And then we shrunk it to 40, and now it's 20. And it's still a three-day event where you are drafting. You know, we're drafting, you know, 1,200 players in, the, in, our, in our heyday. Wow. And, you know, even now when you're talking about 20 rounds times 30 teams, and it, it really starts to add up. And, and in order, you know, when we were doing the 40 round draft, in order to get to the point where you were able to draft 40 players, you'd have to have about a thousand players turned in. And, you know, and, and the, I remember this, if you don't mind me going on. A Please. Tangent. No, we actually, if we got to, if you could wrap this up in about two minutes, we got to just close. This is a shorter pod today. Jim, so yeah. <laughs> no, please, make it go please. Right. every story you want to tell. So Scott Service, uh, the the Come on. our our wonderful they should manager. have been manager of the year, yeah, for sure. Got hosed for a second consecutive yeah. year. Come on, you know Scott was uh, he came to Anaheim with me when I went to the Angels back in the the, the fall of 2011, right? And he was the assistant general manager who oversaw scouting and player development. And Scott had a vast history in, in player development. That's why he's you so know, good with players. It, he's wonderful. And, and it's, it's programming. It's teaching. He's a teacher uh, who happens to be teaching baseball. Wow. Uh, and, you know, he, 
that was his background. He came from a family of coaches. He, after retiring, he went into player development with the Texas Rangers yeah. and spent six years running their farm system. Comes over to the Angels, and it was the first time he was ever going to oversee scouting as well, which had had been what I was doing for the previous, you know, 15, 10 years or whatever it was. And, and uh, you know, Scott, Scott said when we were getting ready for our first draft, you know, we, we had about, you know, 900 names and and uh the the 900 names in a 40 round draft seems like you're going to be short because if you just do the math it's 1200 players and i said no you'll you'll be fine at 900 and he was he was wigging out about the fact he said we're going to run out of names we're not going to know who to have and i said i said we won't run out of names but if, if if in the event that should come to pass and we we all you have to do is hold your hand up and say we pass and they'll let you pass. So how many rounds again for a baseball? So now game? it's down to twenty. You know, even when the Duggars had nineteen and counting kids, I was like, "There's no way you know all your kids. There's no way you love them all. There's no way that's just too many." So twelve hundred players. I'm like, "Are you? How do you get invested in that many people?" Globally, we have sixty three people in our scouting department gotcha. who you know from from the far east to Iowa you know they, they will they, they'll they'll manage writing reports on and getting to know as many of these players as they can so there's somebody in Iowa right now that could send you a text tomorrow being like I just yep. met this sophomore in high school who's going to be the next Randy Johnson that's right or more importantly when they're sitting in the draft room they know who the kids are when we're talking about a guy, you know, Adam might be sitting in 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 the, the you know the outer ring of our of our draft room, and I just got know, the invite. Mark we're, this. We're we're talking to them about the we're talking about a, a given player, right. and he's going to chime in about his makeup, about his work ethic, and they get to know these kids, and it's it's amazing how how in depth you know our scouting group will get with the the background profile on these young players. It's impressive for sure. Immediately, what you're, um, what it's feeling uh, similar to is when I was in the fraternity at API USC, and they would have uh, the rush, and the social chairs would have these meetings. A brother would go, "Hey, we're having this event. We're going to a Laker game, and then this club come out." And then they talk to you, and then being on the other side, once I was in the fraternity, everyone would go into the brotherhood room and talk about the guys they met that that night. And the girls do it too, where it's like, they'd be like, all right, uh, Adam Ray. And somebody would stand up and go, I talked to Adam uh, for about 20 minutes. He was really chill. Uh, he's a big fan of uh, uh, boobs, which we all love, so that's pretty cool. Uh, he drank a lot. But, uh, he was a little uh, aggressive on the cheese uh, plates, but I think we can all get over that. I feel like there's a similar vibe with the way you guys are talking about players, where you're going through all the pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. The question I'm uh, getting at is, is uh, if somebody, can you tell in their description of a player if they're maybe not as passionate, but they still want to, you know, provide like, here's somebody that we're looking at, but you can tell like they're enthusiastic. Not for me. Yeah. Yes. We, we get it all And you time. pick up on that. So, so, you know, when I first started in scouting, we used to, when we were done scouting a player or a team, you know, it, it was, we had to call in and get, leave a voicemail message. And I'm thinking, come on, man, what is this 1975? It's a, they're a voicemail message. Yeah. But the, after I started running scouting departments, the voice is a really important, important aspect of, of evaluating a player because you as the director, whatever you're directing, you get to hear the passion or the inflection oh, of yeah. the voice, the, you know, and and I never considered that. And and a, a veteran baseball man told me he said it's not what they say, it's how they say it. You know, they're always going to think that their player can hit or their player can run, and it, and he might be the best hitter or runner in Iowa or in Illinois. They don't know what it looks like compared to the best hitter or runner in Texas or in Florida, but they do know how much they want that player because they got to know the person, and you'll hear that come out. Yeah, tone in what you say. I love that you said, what did you say again? It's not what you say, it's how you say it's it. It's exactly right. Yeah, if Neil yeah. Armstrong would have said, that's one small stuff for man, a giant leap for mankind, you'd be like, all right, is he even on the moon? These guys are a little too uh, silly for my taste. Giddy up, baby! Giddy up! Giddy up! And the Mariners win this ball game! Okay, so we need to talk about, because we're here, and I, I loved seeing you in the, I think they cut to you when they, uh, after they cut to Riz, uh, when Big Dumper, who just raised the 12th man flag. Which is awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And the fact that he's embraced it, I actually did uh, Wyman and Bob, my favorite show here on the uh, ESPN Seattle, and they had Dumper on right after me. And, uh, 
And he was talking about how his mom has even embraced it and where she's like now referring like, I'm Big Dumper's mom, <laughs> which is awesome. And uh, he was a great interview. Um, they cut to you uh, uh, in the, uh, the booth and right after Riz, can you just speak to that game, the energy um, afterwards in the clubhouse, the whole, I mean, service on the field, clearly a cigar, maybe had snuck in a shot. Um, amazing, maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, amazing on the mic, by the way. I'm sure you knew that he had that in his pinky, but just, um, I guess the atmosphere, how about that going into the game? Are you nervous, excited? I think excited, you know, it, all of us anticipated that that was our, that was going to be our night, including the fans, you know, they, they packed in, they filled it. Was it Friday you night know, fireworks show too? It was. Get and, out of here. You know, it, it like couldn't have drawn it up much better. And John Stanton walked into my office, which, which faces first street and, or first Avenue. And, and, uh, and he walked in and he pointed out the, the, the window and he said, he said, we don't usually see that. And it was, I would say it was about, 3.30 in the afternoon and, you know, First Avenue around the, the statues and headed up down, you know, Edgar Martinez, just lines of people. Flash. And, and, uh, it was, it was fun. It was unique. And, and then when the game started, you felt the, the, the drama building is, and I'll give Oakland a ton of credit. They played us as tough as can be. And, yeah. you know, and we weren't sharp for the final two weeks of September. And, you know, in that moment when it starts, when we drift toward late innings and everything's tied and now it's in, we're, we're headed into the extras and, and, uh, the, like, the, the heightened awareness, like something special is going to happen here. And, and when Cal hit that home run, first of all, it's the coolest moment, uh, really the coolest moment in my baseball career. Oh, Just, sure. uh, you know, of all the things that I've been part of or have seen, nothing beat that because of the way the crowd reacted, the way the anticipation of two decades of people waiting to see this. And with the right-hander on the mound, Scott Service going to his bench and calling on Cal. He didn't come up with it. A big double, maybe a home run. The pitch from Acevedo. A drive deep to right field. Down the line. The Mariners win this game 2-1. The dream lives. They're going to the playoffs. The drought is over. Cal Raleigh. And Cal's reaction, you know, like the holy shit. Gra grab Great. your hat. There's no way this is happening. It's, just kid, it's what every kid, yep. when they say, yep. when every player says you dream about that as a kid, especially professional players, I mean, you know, I'm not a professional baseball player, not with that attitude, but I also dreamt of doing the walk-off home run when I played Little League. Everybody did, right? And he did it. No one's ever done it before. There's a, so this we found out after the fact. No one has ever hit a walk-off home run to clinch a playoff spot for their team in Major League history. It's never happened. On a Friday before a fireworks show yeah. with J.D. Depoto. <laughs> yeah, there, I love how specific the stats get. Yeah, on a Friday with the weather, with the wind chill at 46 degrees. Yeah, uh, the vibe was insane. I was in my hotel room in Memphis shooting Young Rock. The cast wanted me to go out. I was like, I got to watch this game. I was like, I can't be out because I'm going to be a mess with you guys and I'm also just going to be antisocial. So I'm on my computer watching it on uh, MLB uh, TV, just sipping cocktails. And and it was the drama, you're right, the drama built to where it was like, the script is kind of, the stage is set. Like, like it feels like a walk-off should happen. Were fans nervous or was it just like everyone kind of felt like that moment was was imminent? And so it was like... Uh, See, I, th I, I feel like most felt the moment was imminent. Yeah. You know, but the longer it goes, the less imminent it feels, right? Yeah. There, like you feel like, all right, we're th this moment's passing by, and you know, I can remember earlier in the month we were playing Atlanta, and a, a number like the the entire Atlanta Braves coaching staff are people that I either played with or played against. That happens or, a lot. Yeah, you just know all these cool. people. So I'm overstanding with them before the final game of that, which was an epic series in and of itself. You know, it was a phenomenal. Julio and uh, Eugenio. Exactly. Yeah. And and that was actually this day. So you know we, we're we're standing there, and you know Walt Weiss, who was a teammate of mine, Love and Walt Weiss. Kevin Seitzer, and, and Eric Young Jr., another teammate. Was Wally of mine. Joyner there. We have uh, the same birthday, by the way. Wally. Yeah, that was also the first, a great guy. First celeb, really? Yeah, great guy. First, yeah. first celebrity. Also, you're naming names that are just such, such to me classic baseball names. Yeah, they're all former teammates. They're great guys. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but they're all sitting there, and Ron Washington, who for years was was managing the Rangers yeah. in the division, and then was the infield coach for the A's. So all the years that we had been, you know, I'd been in the American League West. Wash was there, and 
watch finally walks over and he gives me a hug and he said, he said, well, congratulations. He said, you finally got them there. You finally did it. And I said, ah, I watched you give somebody long enough and, and, and enough trust to figure it out. Right. And, uh, and I said, but I will say we still have some work to do. He goes, ah, you'll, you'll get it done. So if that's, that's done. And then, and then we just, we, we played poorly for the next seven days. And I'm like, ah, did, did we just get jinxed or something here? Cause then we went on that last road trip. Yes. It was just awful. That was KC yeah. and then KC, Oakland, Oakland Texas, I mean, we, maybe. Yeah. Speak we, to that real quick because yeah, we were, I mean, with the, uh, was it 14 game win streak earlier yep. in the year? And then we were just kind of cruising for a little bit. And Julio was becoming the face of baseball, which was getting us a lot of attention. High drive, deep left, center field. That baby's way gone. Julio! Blue Jay fans in the building, those four games. Fly ball. Easy play. Wow, the wind must be holding it up. Julio had to come in. Wow, what a great athletic play. Here comes the payoff. Julio blasts this out to center. This is driven back by the wall. Julio Grand Slam. I think we were just clicking on a lot of uh, positive cylinders. So to have uh, a stretch, especially the timing of it, is so awful. Um, what is the, um, is this a thing you turn to Scott to go, keep them, uh, you know, positive, keep it loose? Like, what is the, are you guys having discussions behind closed doors about it? Yeah, we did. I think there was, by the time we got to the end of that road trip, you know, and, and I believe the the order of events where we, we played poorly in Oakland and then we played even worse in Kansas City. And and we were standing in the, the coach's room. And as a general rule, there's an expectation. We all believe we're going to make the postseason. I think by this time, we're 99% right. certainty of, of, of going to the postseason. And you don't really believe the 99% when you're when you're losing games the way we were losing them. And and, uh, you know, there's you can feel tension building. And one night we were sitting in the clubhouse. This was in Oakland. We were sitting in the clubhouse and Scott comes in and throws his hat on the table. And, uh, you know, one of our coaches leaned back in the chair and said, boy, we got to change something. I said, not really. It's just baseball. You know, you just said there's sooner or later they're going to realize that, that, that the, the golden egg is right there. And they won't play tense because we were playing tense. And, you know, the, the way to solve tension isn't to go add more tension. It's mm -hmm. to find a way to take it away. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the way you can take it away is just don't talk about it. You know, go out, do something fun. Do something, you know, outside the norm. Don't take BP one day. This is where I think Joe Madden made his his hay back in the the Rays Cubs days when 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 he was the first to go off the reservation. It's, ah, screw it, we're not taking BP for the next three months, you know. And the guys responded. They, they you know, it was something different, you know. And we, here we are. We had two weeks left to go in a season where it was it seemed imminent we were going to the postseason. And our guys were tense, and we had to find a way to break the tension. Can you gauge the tension? Like, do you see like Ty going up there, like, oh, oh it's palpable. Fuck. Like, yeah. and you're like, relax, bro. Yeah. Or yeah. is it? It's it's just trying too hard. It's not it's not fear. It's it's more. They're putting more in, and you see guys, you know, they're they're pushing harder, thinking they have to do something more instead of just doing what they always do. Wow. And you know, where it finally broke for us was the what I would call the worst loss th that I think we've experienced in our time with the, the Mariners was the, the loss in Kansas City where, you know, I think we we put up an eight spot and then we went out and gave up an eight spot. Yeah, and dude. Bases are loaded. Class has walked three men here in the sixth. Chance with JP. It is center and a base hit. Kelnick scores and a chance for two. That's what happens. Toro slides across double digits for the Mariners today. It is a one-run game. Oh, my goodness. Ryan O'Hearn has single flied out, walked, and scored. Line to right field. Unbelievable. Olivares scores. Massey is around third. The Royals have taken the lead. 12 to 11. My dad came to that game with me and was sitting in the box and was you know, oh, excited to be there. He's yeah. out for the day. We're yeah. watching a ball game. We are cruising. We just dropped a, you know, a, a touchdown and, a, and an extra point yes. on him. And then we come back it's and like we're copping it right back up. Oh, and, and uh, you know, when when we started to, to, to give that game back, 
he turned around and he said, well, this isn't going according to script. And I said, yeah, we're not going to talk about this. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is, um, it's so interesting to hear uh, and refreshing that it is just not as, as black and white as that, but like that, you know, we're all still uh, people at the end of the day. And that a way to, like you said, cut tension is to not make a bigger deal out of it and to do something fun. Was there, was there um, did Scott organize like a, guitar hero night or was it like uh or was it like did you kind of really push guys to like not do a certain thing or like go obviously not go out but um are there things that he has in his bag of tricks that kind of helps cut through it so we do a lot of those things through the course of the year and and usually they're they're scheduled ahead of time the the way you break the tension is hey no bp tomorrow show and go and guys will you know Somebody's still going to show up at one o'clock in the afternoon because that's their rhythm and that's right. their timing. And the other guy's going to roll in at five thirty and say, "Let's play." And and uh, that was that was the tonic this time was show and go. It worked, so we showed and goed quite a few times for the rest of the season. And then the guys, once we got back on track, we responded more often than not with like the the do fun things. I mean, we, we'll do anything from the dress up days. I, I think we we did a twins day where you got <laughs> partnered with a, you know, you got partnered with somebody that was drawn out of a hat, and then you had to dress as identical twins, Amazing. which was pretty funny, you know. Yeah. Uh, my favorite version of that. You remember Deho Lee? Oh yeah. Uh, Deho was a riot. I mean, fun no guy to have awesome. on, on a team, awesome. and you know, showing up as on Twins Day with Deho <laughs> was phenomenal. You know. <laughs> Uh, the, the, both, both he and his, his partner came dressed up. They were wearing kimonos and like old, like, oh, yeah, like the, the traditional, you know, the regalia. And it was just so funny. You know what I'm just thinking of? I did the roast of Big Poppy. Um, I don't know if I told you about this with, uh, Bill Burr, Anthony Mackie, Lenny Clark. It was in Boston. At the oh, House this is funny. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, who else was on it? Uh, Pedroia and Gronk. And, uh, and I dressed up in full prosthetic as an 80-year-old Yankees fan. Couldn't recognize. <laughs> I went in on Pedroia so hard that he looks over to my buddy, Josh Wolf, a comedian who organized it, was like, who the fuck is this old guy? Like, I'm really tired of it. Because I, I hit everybody, but I probably had six or seven in a row where it was like, you know, Dustin Pedroia is here. We all know Dustin plays second base, but his most natural position is dancing next to a, a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. <laughs> just That's not right. Yeah. slaying him to where he was just like, enough short jokes, man. My ass fire in. Yep, suck it all. Suck the jizz and the shit. Look, that's right, 27 championships. 27. That's a big number. 27 is a great number. It's also the number of shitty dance moves Rob Gronkowski does to impress a girl before he roofies her. Jump number one. That's right, I'm a Yankees fan, die hard. I'm a Yankees fan here in Boston, which is, uh, which, you know, means I got the biggest balls in the room, right? Not the longest, that's fucking Lenny, but... But I'm thinking it could be fun to do some sort of like roast of the, like me in full as I don't know who it is, maybe an ex player from like the early Mariners days coming into the clubhouse to uh, to roast everybody. This would I'm be pitching fun. it now. Yeah, this would be fun. Okay, I'd go with Felix. Oh, you know? oh yeah, I'd go oh. with Felix. Yeah. So you bring Felix in to do it, and dress him up. There's no, I'd I'd make Felix the roastee. Oh, gotcha. Right? Oh, so you bring me in as an like old player and then set up Felix to roast in front yeah. of everybody? Because okay. Felix is the, he is like the, 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 the bounce point. So many of the, the, the great Mariners teams in the 90s, you know, those, the, the fun, like the Junior and Buner, yeah. Dan Wilson and Edgar, like those groups, they played together for a long time. And then that group led to, like, led up to Felix. And then Felix, for the longest time, he was the pivot point. Gotcha. He took you from the Edgar Dan Wilson yeah. era to, you know, to he and each row into that next chapter. Wow. So they touched a lot of guys. Uh, okay. So I'm and he's fun. Yeah. He's yeah. He seems awesome. I'm uh, I'm crying in Memphis when uh, when Cal hits the home run. I thought you were going to tell me you were crying in Memphis when, when <laughs> Felix came out and threw the first pitch in that playoff. Game. Very so emotional for that. Yeah. That was a lot of people were. Um, all right, put a pin in that. Uh, so Cal hits the the dinger. Um, what's the initial emotion? I mean, just when everyone's going crazy, is it like, are you almost like euphoric to where you can't? Because, I mean, it, I'm watching, the, whoever, by the way, was directing the broadcast, crushed it. Oh, killed it. Yeah. Right? I mean, I don't know how much you, you pick up I've on I've gone that back stuff. and watched it. Yeah. It was from, again, cutting to you, to Riz going nuts, the energy, everybody, they cut to every pocket of like 300 level to, the, to people right behind home plate. Wow, indeed. 
And now, wow, this time up for a blown call strike. What it's our a, home run. What a great effort by Logan Gilbert going eight strong, giving up just the one run. Terrific. You cannot add. This is going to be the biggest anymore. winner's dance going right now. This circle is going to have everybody in it down oh, yeah. on the field. Wait for everybody. Wait for all the guys. Congratulations to Jerry DePoto. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, I love it, it. I love it. Beautiful. I love it. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. Playoffs, baby. The dream has awesome. happened. <laughs> the drought uh, is over. And the emotion was, like, incredible. Um, and then obviously with the team being out on the field and then doing the giant uh, happy dance. Um, I guess just talk me through once you see it go out, what's happening. So we had, uh, I, I, the first thing I did was I cried. You know, I just started crying. And like a lot of people did. And I just jumping up and down. And my wife and was downstairs sitting with, with my daughters and, and my daughter's husband. Awesome. Uh, they wanted to be outside in the crowd and not cooped up in the box. Get it. You know? So they're all down there jumping around. I turned around, you know, Justin Hollander, his wife, some of our front office people are up there. We just started hugging each other and crying. And I remember saying, this is the coolest thing that's happened in, the, in my major league life because of what it meant for the city and what it meant to that team. And we can talk about the fact that, that this generation of Mariners players, the guys in that clubhouse, because we're such a young team, they didn't really contribute to 21 years of missing the postseason. Mm -hmm. You know, they contributed to two. And they shouldn't have had to wear the two decades yeah. burden, yeah. but they did. And until that they moment, I didn't realize how much it meant to our players to overcome that two decade long void. It mattered to them. Yeah, what an interesting perspective. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. They had nothing to do with it, yet wearing the whole <laughs> like I would think we've been pressure. trying to take that pressure or that onus off of them for years. Like, ah, this isn't on them. This is, a, you know, it's an organizational burden. This comes from, you know, generations of player. Yeah. And, and when it got right down to it, that's why they started getting tense in mid-September is they saw how close they were to, to doing this. And, and from the time we started our rebuild back at the end of 2018, a lot of our young players, even in the minor leagues, would talk about what was going to happen the day we, we, we tripped this wire and, and got to the postseason for the first time and what that was going to feel like. And, and it never really dawned on me that this group of players was that, you know, was that thoughtful about the fact that totally. this meant so much to so many people. It's a very mature approach. Yeah, it really is. It's a, it's a mature group. Yeah, Castillo, we got Luis Castillo in um, July. Uh, right about 1st August. Right. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, again, yeah. thanks for that. He worked all right. I yeah. mean, just an incredible move. Swing and a miss, and Alfaro strikes out. Castillo's 1-2. A wave and a miss. Swing and a miss. The 0-2. He gets them swinging after the slider. Oh, he's ducking away from strike three. And 98 gets him. And locking him down, too, just. What is what goes into locking somebody down like that earlier than later? Because in listening or watching shows, you know, and right out of the gate, he was showing his impact. Uh, you know, I, I am curious, at what point do you guys go sooner than later? And what goes into that? So, you know, so we, he, we acquired him. We said, welcome to the Mariners. You want about a hundred million bucks. And he said, sure. <laughs> There's a, it, it, we had a feeling when we traded for him that we would have, uh, if there was an opportunity to, to sit him down and, and get someone excited about staying in a town, there's never been a better time to do it than Seattle in August and September. Come you know, on. that, that six week stretch when he first got here, we're playing incredibly well it's a fun team to be around the energy in our ballpark is just off the charts you, you know you go anywhere in seattle you go to a restaurant you go to a grocery store and all people are talking about is the mariners and the players feel that energy too and and uh he i don't know about a week after uh he he joined us we started we were while when we acquired castillo we were in the midst of doing julio's extension Wow. About a week after we acquired Luis, we finished Julio's extension, and then we announced it right about there. And then when I what Julio got extended, I didn't. I don't think yeah. I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, it was. Totally. It, it was. You know, we, we did it. It was. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was unique. It only took a 
couple of days to work it out. Yeah, isn't he extended like, to like 2096 or something like that? Uh, yeah. he'll, he'll be here until you know his, his son catches up. Bro, and please. Thank you. Again, another solid move. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming, uh, especially the guys in uniform. You know, really cool that you guys showed up and, and support your teammate. Uh, this is a fantastic moment uh, in the history of our organization. Over these last two years, coming out of our, our roster reboot, watching this city get excited about Mariners baseball, watching this team take it to a different level in terms of energy and on-field performance and come together in ways that we couldn't have imagined, truly. And to to watch a young player like Julio show up on opening day and make his way through the, the first month of the season when things weren't so easy and since the first of May, truly just be a driving force, uh, not just for our team, but in baseball at large, he's very quickly become a, a very recognizable face. And this contract that, that we were able to, to arrive on with, with Ulysses Cabrera of Octagon can't say enough about what Ulysses did in, in getting this done and working with Julio and collaborating with us on, on a contract that is really unique. And it was required. You know, we needed to do something unique and hopefully ensure that Julio spends the rest of his career here in Seattle. So with that, any questions that you might have, you know, I'll kick it to Julio and Ulysses if they'd like to add anything, but but glad to answer any questions that, that anybody might have. John. You. The um, mission of the Mariners is threefold. One, win championships. Two, delight our fans. And three, serve the communities. We have a long-term commitment to winning and we have a short-term commitment to winning the signing of julio rodriguez to this contract is evidence of that commitment i just want to thank jerry depoto justin hollander and their team for a tremendous job i think ulysses has a couple of comments ulysses yeah i think um a lot of people will focus on the contract and the nuances and the details and the average annual value and the length and really, that's missing the point on this one. I think this is all about the city of Seattle. I think it's all about the organization recognizing how much the Seattle fans love their athletes. I mean, I I grew up in California, and I live in Florida, and I spent a lot of time going to different stadiums. But the energy that the fans here bring is not able to be compared anywhere else. I mean, I met or I saw Ichiro Girl last night. That was amazing. And you, you run through the names, Randy, Griffey, you know, you look at Gary Payton, look at Casey Keller. People here love their teams, their athletes. And I think what you guys have done here is, is give the fans in that next generation somebody to say, Hey, let's go to the baseball game. Let's watch Julio and the team. You saw what happened last night when you guys won and that celebration with everybody dancing in the middle of the field. That's special. And it starts with the energy and, and the love of team. And I think Julio represents that. So I'm excited for everybody here. And Julio, any opening comment? I mean, what can I say? I'm just happy to be a Mariner. I'm just happy to be a Mariner for as long as I can. Happy to you guys for giving me the opportunity to change my family's life. Not today, but uh, 2017 when you guys gave me the opportunity. And, I, and since that day, I felt committed to you guys. And as Ulysses said, this is not about the contract, how long it is. I would love to be a Mariners for the rest of my career and play in front of the Mariners fans. For the rest of my career, play, play with a lot of these guys here, being managed by Scott, having Ty as my babysitter, being with Mitch, I, everybody. <laughs> nah. Like, I, I genuinely mean that. I love being here. I love be, being with everybody. And I love to keep representing this city and bring a campus because that's how we want here. And I know that's what we, we're driving for. Win for the city and win for these fans. So, so Luis, Luis can, can feel, feel what's, what's, I guess, I guess what but then he, he called us. us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. He called, he called he's, he's, because, because we, we had inquired when, when we traded, traded for him. You know, you know, hey, let, let us know, know if the time comes when, when it's appropriate to sit down and talk about extending Luis. We would want to do this. You know, it's typically not an in season move for a veteran player. You know, we said if this is something you'd like to talk about. September, September of this year, we can, we can, we can do, do it in the off season or, or the spring, spring of next season, which is usually your extension hot zone. zone. And, and uh, the agent said, oh, we'll let you know how it goes and we'll, we'll, we'll give you some feedback. feedback. But, you know, he's, he's, he's probably interested in talking about the money correct. 
And then, and then after, after we did Julio, Julio the agent called, called back and said, hey, I just talked to the Rockies, Rockies in. And then it, 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 from, from there, it took days, days to, to wow. negotiate the right deal. deal. And that's, that's a good, good sign, sign, I feel like. like yeah. if he, he, he wants, wants to be. He's seen, seen enough, and he loves it. it. And, that's and that's another thing that, that I think is really special, is that, like, like you said, a guy like that's coming in that has nothing to do with, A, the, the most newest team member, so truly no ties to the decade drought, decade drought, Embraces, embraces it and, and it's like, like now cares, cares about it as, as if he had, had been attached to it, to it right but once it right. probably ended as much as guys, guys who've been here from uh, you know you know for the, for the longest tenure, tenure. And then, and then the, the, the you know what, what we were able, able to do with him, him running, running a playoff, playoff rotation, rotation is, is you know being matched, matched up, up. We, we, we played you know maybe the two best offensive teams in the American but certainly two of the three and and maybe not just in the American maybe in baseball and then and, and, you know, we went, went out there, and, and, and he, I mean, he, he showed, showed up, man. It, it, was, it, was, it was very, very impressive, impressive to do that in, in Toronto against the Blue Jays and, and in Houston, Houston against, against the Astros. Astros. And, and he just, just shut, shut them down. down. Got him. Guerrero strikes out. Look at the movement on that pitch. Way inside. One away. Before we get into that, and um, and if you've talked at, at uh, Najem about these experiences um, just, you know, put up a stiff arm or something. But I if, feel the, like, if there's ever a day where I get sick of talking about these experiences, <laughs> okay, like good. if you want to ask me about some, you know, the turd burger loss somewhere in the middle of September, <laughs> yeah, let's okay, talk cool. about something else. It still feels pretty fresh, too, I feel like. And also the momentum of just a few months ago and how we're only a few months away from starting up again is pretty fucking rad, right? So the, 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 the way that works in, in fandom, like with what we do, from the moment our season ended, now we are immediately transitioning toward building 23. Mm. You know, we're building our 23 roster and we have mu- far fewer holes to fill moving forward. Our, you know, our young foundation. Yeah. We started a lot of our off-season work was done in season with guys like Luis Castillo. And, and you know, we're already starting to transition into that mode. But what's funny is so did the fans because we went from, you know, the – the, the praise or the organizational praise, how excited people were, yeah. you know, crying in the, literally crying in the streets, hugging one another that we, we made it over this hump to knocked out of the playoffs. A lot of congratulatory, you know, emails or cards immediately followed by the list of free agents that we should pursue. And here are the deals that I think we should do. And, you know, we'll get so many of those. It's it's letters and it's emails with people who've got ideas about acquisitions and, and how to run a $400 million payroll. It's, it's, uh, it's people that are fans. Oh yeah. They're into it. So the yeah. same way that I get pitched movie ideas or jokes from uh, my stepdad, George over here. Uh, and by the way, I'll say this 87% of them, great ideas. Yep. There's a couple that are actually we're going to try to see through on. Um, but so you're getting fans that are sending in like truly, hundreds. Of now, let them. me. Yeah. There's no way in hell that you that you ever hear, that some of them are like, wow. That's so actually- for, for years, I responded to them, you know, the, to the to the the inquiries, the letters, the ideas, because I was I always thought about it like, all right, if I'm a fan and I spent my whole life as a fan and I and I wrote a letter to a general manager or whatever I do in a given time. You know, how cool would it be if I get some kind of response walking me through, you know, why this is a good idea Hell or yeah. something we couldn't do, you know? Uh, it, free agents, you can do it. You can't really do it when people are suggesting trades because you can't talk about other people's players. That's the right. right? Right. So, you know, we will, for years, I would take out a little note card and I, and I would jot down a little response and stick it in the mail. And then, and then it became kind of a thing that people knew I would re- respond. And then they started coming in heavier and heavier. And there's only so much time in your day that you can do that. Right. So now I'll occasionally, if somebody sends a nice, well thought out email, I'll, I'll type a little response. I can't really do much in the, the written reply right. group anymore, but you know, it, it's, from any of them, you, you'll get the, you know, I think it would be a fantastic offseason if we signed Carlos Correa and Kodai Singa and, and it runs off the top free agents in each category <laughs> and then traded so and so for such and such. You know, that would be the finishing touch on our team. No, that just recreated our old team. You know, you never get anything that's like, uh, hey, we, uh, you know, I know we just locked in Julio, but like, Think of the draft picks we could get for him next year. We never get that one. Okay. Yeah, we never get that one. Just a delusional fan. Uh, you said, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but before we sat down that you have a lot of, um, what did you say, oars in the water yeah, right now? Yeah, we're, we're like a Viking boat right now. Uh, is this, obviously, I think it, being in a sweet spot of less holes to fill going into next 
year 2023, but also because there's less holes to fill, maybe even a little bit more, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, uh, not stress, but just because less holes to fill and maybe there's less options at those holes. So is there maybe more work to do? I don't think it's th- there's more work to do. Right. Uh, there's There are fewer targets. So you're, you know, you're probably, the stress level is knowing that once those targets go away, right. that dried up your, your, your dartboard, so to speak. Right. But you know, it's a, we do have fewer holes to fill, and one of the things that we are conscious of, and it, the, when we last sat down, you know, the, the first time we did this, yeah. you know, there's this is such a fun, it's a unique group, and and part of what what uh, makes us engaging with our fans that 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 brings out the emotion that you saw for the final two months of this year, some of what made our team good is the personality that the team has. And and my biggest thing going into this offseason is we want to get better. We want to find ways to get better on the margins. We want to add meaningful impact to our lineup. We think our pitching staff is deep as is and, and high impact. We do want to get better offensively. How can we do that without changing the personality of our team mm-hmm. in a meaningful way? Because once you change it, yeah, I'm not a scientist, and I don't know the secret to you know the, the uh, how to make uh, the, how to make new Coke. Right. But but I do know that I've screwed it up enough uh, over time. When, when you are when you have something that works, don't be too quick to change that thing. You yeah. know, find the way to add to it without changing. You know, meaningfully changing the way the team works. Love that payoff. Broken back, dropping, dropping, dropping. I think I just read actually something about you saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, about that some teams and organizations like to take a little more time finessing moves, right? And you were like, no, if it's if we can yeah. do it now, let's act. We're, we're a bull in a china closet. Gotcha. You know, it's a, we will we have developed a, a, I guess a reputation in the in the industry for being the the canned team. This is what we want. This is how we want to do it. Are you in? And you know, and we'll we'll approach things in a very direct manner. And it, we've also developed a bit of a reputation for being on the creative side. So you know, if we suggest something to somebody, but that's unappealing to them, we're we don't stop at no. You know, we just find the creative solution that because nobody just says, "Ah, we wouldn't do." They say, ah, we couldn't do that because, and then they'll give you some kind of feedback and and just take that feedback, start pulling on it. And that's when you start, that's how you put together deals. And, you know, as a result, we, we do a lot of deals because we don't, we don't stop at no, we, 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 we pick up where no leaves us and, and we start a new idea. Are we in the Aaron Judge sweepstakes? Uh, no. Yeah. yeah no. Yeah. It's a. There's mostly because once we picked up Teoscar Hernandez and again, huge. You know, Teo can really hit. Someone that we've always followed and admired. Um, again, both for his on the field contribution and what we believe to be um, clubhouse locker room contribution uh, to the environment. Obviously, that's something we take very seriously. We felt like a goal that we had in the off season was we needed to get more dangerous offensively, you know, either by adding length throughout the lineup or adding a middle of the order impact that. Um, obviously, there's still more work to do, we think, uh, and we, there are things we'd like to do. It's always a surprise for a player, I think. Uh, for me, it, it, this is the second time that I've been traded, so uh, it's always a little bit of a surprise for, for, for the people. For me, it, it feels like it's a new chapter on myself, and uh, I think I'm going to enjoy it the best that I can, and I'm going to give everything that I got to the Seattle Mariners and, uh, and the fans. As it works out with Teo and Julio in the outfield, we do want to continue to give our young guys opportunity. Mm. And one of the complications with the, the for us at the top of the, the free agent food chain, and this goes maybe it flies under the radar, is you know you can only add so much. Uh, because right now, I think with the exception of the San Diego Padres and the Atlanta Braves, you know, no one owes more future dollars than the Seattle Mariners. Uh, 2024 and beyond, you know, there's only two teams that have wow. bigger commitments than wow. we do. And that comes with Logan Gilbert and George Kirby and Cal Raleigh, who, who will all go to salary arbitration in the next, you know, season or two. Wow. And, you know, that starts to build up heavily. Yeah. So the, factor that in. 
while we could easily float somebody on our 2023 budget, there's a the 2023 turns into 2024, 2026, and 2028 when you know the bills are due on Robbie Ray and Luis Castillo and, and Julio, et cetera. So you do those things and, and you bite off something on the front end. What you wind up doing is you cut off your tail. Mm. And you know, we want to build a sustainable winner, something that can last over time. And and in order to do that, you have to show some restraint on the front end. Sure. So uh, you know, we went out and we did Teo and, and it fit because it was a one year uh, commitment yeah. at what should be fairly high dollar. And, you know, and it gave us a chance to get to know another player because what we do know about him personality wise, he would fit us. You know, have we checked in on the, the, the top free agents we have? You know, would be would be would we be willing to go there on a certain number of them? Yeah, we probably would, you know, but it's going to have to really fit what we think our window is. Right. Because if it starts to tip the scales on our ability to keep the core of that team together, then you're making decisions that you can't undo. I didn't get to ask you this last time, but I feel, feel like most fans are so enamored by the whole um, winter meetings, uh, trade deadline, the whole process. Even last time when we had to reschedule, which you were so generously still trying to fit it in. I think it was in the heart of the trade deadline. And you're like, yeah, if we can reschedule, it'd be great. I have about nine calls I haven't gotten back to yet. And I was like, oh, yeah, like this is the most intense time uh, for you guys. Um, but is it like, you know, that scene of Moneyball uh, with Brad Pitt where um, uh, where he's, uh, I think, trading pain. He's doing a bunch of different moves and it's very intense. He's eating popcorn. He's calling three different people back. He's like, Joanne, get me this guy on the phone. He's calling a, a general manager saying, we want this guy. This guy's on the table. And then he called like the Giants and was like, hey, I heard that they want him. Blah, blah, blah. Call me back. Get your pyro on the phone. You thinking Rincon? Yeah, his season's done. He's lost faith. I think he's going to dump him. Hardcore. Shapiro on two. Mark, Billy, let's be honest. A premier setup man isn't going to get you any closer to the playoffs. Are you referring to Rincon? He's a luxury you can't afford, man. And you can? There's half a million on his contract, and we've got at least one other suitor. By at least one, you mean one. Who is it? I'd rather not say. San Francisco. San Francisco. I'll call you back. What do you think you can get from Magnante? Nothing. What's left on Benefro's contract? 275. Suzanne, give me Sabian on the line. If we can get the Giants interested in Benefro, Mark's only got one buyer left for Rick Home. Us. On three. Sabi Sabster, it's Billy. What do you think of Benefro? I can let you have him for almost nothing. Why would you do that, Billy? Because I'm amazing. Uh-huh. All I want is a couple of bucks and a sweetener. Throw in, say... Anderson. Anderson. I like Anderson. No, you don't. Nobody likes him. I don't even know why I'm doing this, but let's just do it, okay? Benefro from Michelson. Anderson. Anderson. See, I don't even know his name. I'll think about it. Think about it and call me back. Is there an element to uh, the chaos for you guys that's that's similar? There is, and you know, it, it kicks in like that, especially at the winter meetings, where, where now you're in that kind of Jerry Maguire moment where Whoa. you have two phones and somebody else is on the phone. You just got back from know. that. There's a, no, we're going there. Are we going? Yeah, we're going on Sunday. Uh, it's in Vegas. Yeah, the GM meetings we just got back from. Gotcha. Okay. The 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 winter meetings tend to the GM meetings are where the conversations start, and the winter meetings are usually when they culminate. So it's a you start talking about the potential for a trade. That's when you first engage with agents about free agents. You know, we've already entertained a couple of free agents who we've brought in for visits that we sat down and spoken with. Cool. And, and, uh, you know, some that were some that you'd met before, others who you'd never met before. You know, I, I particularly was fond of Kodai Senga, who we sat down with. Yeah. Phenomenal impression. He looked every bit of the front of the rotation type starting pitcher because awesome. he's got, you know, really good stuff. Yeah. But uh, we didn't know anything about the person and, and to sit down and get to know about that person and how they're wired. It's, it really is when you're making these decisions, the puzzle is so much about the makeup of your team. And, and you know, every player that you add or subtract from a club, and, and sometimes you think you have it right and sometimes you don't, but it's, it's all about the chemistry that you're creating. And, and, you know, Jim Leland once said to me, I don't know, I'm not a chemist, but I know when you got something good, keep it. Uh, and as soon as you start to F with it too much, you know, it, yeah. you're going to wind up screwing it up. Is it a fun, uh, is it almost like 
you know, a little baseball camp esque with like the fun of it. It is Vegas. I'm sure. I don't know if the food is better during the general manager meetings or the uh, winter meetings, but is it like is the vibe looser or is it a little more tense? Because, like you said, like now when you guys leave, there's going to be a little bit more uh, immediacy for action, right? So we go, you know, the GM meetings this year were in Vegas, yeah. and, and we we hit a couple of good restaurants. Good, so yeah. We went to like a we went to a Malfi one night, oh, yeah. uh, which was fabulous, and then we had the we went to the steakhouse, which. How can it be bad? It's Come called on. the Always steakhouse. Great. Yeah. And, uh, but it's three days, you're in, you're out. Okay. And then the, the, you know, all those conversations started in the time since now, now it's your fielding. We're on the phone every day, Justin, myself, Jesse Smith in our front office. You know, we're going back and forth with other teams, with agents. You know, we, we've recently signed, we're waiting to go through a physical, but we'll have signed a, a, a free agent to, to add to our bullpen. Awesome. And, and we're going through this every day. And, and as it, as it all happens, you know, the, when you get to the winter meetings this year, they're in San Diego. That's when it turns into the, the 24 hours circus. You, you sleep for four hours a night. Everybody's running around like chickens with no head. Mm. And, you know, you think you're losing out. We send, we, we send groups out on recon missions just to gather information because it, it truly is. It's a carnival. You know, you'll get there's thousands of baseball people, you know, and they'll congregate in the lobby. They'll, they'll be outside the hotel at the hotel bar. And, you know, it, it's, it's how you make your chops as a young scout is you go down and the guy who comes back with the, the most or best information starts to catch the, the attention of the yeah. people in charge. And, and, uh, you know, guys will come back. Hey, so and so is looking to do this. So and so is looking to do that. And, and, uh, you know, and, plans change for teams at the winter meetings because they were the team that won the sweepstakes for somebody and then other adjustments have to be made and wow. and if you are the first to pick up the phone when the other adjustments need to be made that's when you find you know, deals can be made deals so it, can be had it could be 11 30 at night you've just finished uh 11 ah, 30 it could be four in the morning you right know, it's okay a, so four in the morning let's say <clears throat> and let's say justin uh hollander is uh you know he's he's hit his limit at craps and he's like, look, and as I've been schmoozing, you know, the uh, whoever's agent, and it's time to go. And then somebody goes, hey, just come get one more, uh, uh, you know, Zima with me. I know you're a big Zima guy, Justin. He goes, I'm actually not, but I'm, you know, when in Vegas. He's got some under his desk. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's got some under his desk. Look at the ice people. And so uh, so he hangs for one more hang and gets maybe one tidbit or soundbite that is, you know, uh, of use. And, like, does he have full jurisdiction to at 430 call you up and go, yo, I just heard this. Oh, or yeah. does he save it for the morning and go, breakfast, I'm going to drop a bomb, and now our plans are changing, but it's, or is it kind of like all all systems go? Well, in, in, in Justin's case, uniquely, you know, there's, I trust Justin to do anything that I would do myself. Cool. You know, and we are so familiar with what the other is thinking all the time that in that moment, if it seems like something we should do, he should just pull the trigger and then call and tell me we're doing something rather than, ask if we're going to do that's something. huge uh that it's the benefit that he brings to the table and you know I, there's he's been with me on a couple of the late night you know where you're you're sitting there and you've you're now meeting with your seventh team of the day and it's you know it's 1 30 in the morning and you're staring at the, the the wall and it's the you know the, the wall and that person's <laughs> face are starting to meld and you're thinking who which team is this again who am i talking <laughs> to and 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 uh you know it's it, but that's when it gets fun and you know, a couple of years ago, we were also in Vegas for the winter meetings and and Justin and Scott Service actually completed a deal that we had been working on for multiple days, you know, leading into it. Yeah. And I wound up in the hospital with blood clots on my lungs and and they came in. This is before Justin was obviously promoted to general manager and they came into my hospital room and and they the one of the teams that was involved in this three team deal wanted to see that that I was on board with it. So they lifted my hand up from bed and and put my my thumb up in the air. It was Holy shit. Yeah, we got footage. It was great. When it was, was great this? stuff. This was winter meetings 2018. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. 2000, yeah, 2018. Uh had you had any help with a scare like that? Uh, yeah, I've had all kinds of weird shit. But the, you know, in, in this particular case, we got to the winter meetings and I was having all kinds of, of like cramping and which was unusual for me. And yeah. then, uh, finally Scott took me to, uh, took me downstairs and said, you gotta, you gotta go to the hospital. And one of our baseball ops guys hopped in an Uber with me. We went over to the hospital and they, they figured out I had 
blood clots on my lungs. So was I, it goobs? Did he hop you in a goobs oobs? He did. He did not. But that would have been. <laughs> It'd have been right away. He's the most helpful guy in the Shout out to uh, <clears throat> Trevor Gooby, Goobs, as you call him. I want to get back to uh, um, uh, the fun uh, baseball things. The atmosphere of of what we just all got to experience. So you go down immediately. What you spend a little bit of time up here, and then you're like, I got to get down to the party. That looks too. Oh fun. no, we fun. were down there right from the yeah. Immediately, yeah. Hugs, uh, everybody. Now I get downstairs. It just, I mean, when you see your wife and, and kids, or is it just? I mean, crazy. See, oddly enough, I didn't get to see them, you know, until long, maybe an hour after the game was over. Yeah. And, you know, immediately we made our way down and, I, you know, goggled up and, you know, took off that. I wore the, there's, this is a lesson I learned years ago. The yeah. first time I was exposed to, to a post-game celebration, wear the B shoes because the A shoes aren't going to survive the, 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 oh, yeah. the event. So, you know, I immediately I flipped on a pair of, of extra B shoes. I ran downstairs and and uh, and then we were swallowed up in the celebration in the clubhouse. Bonkers. It was so much fun. That's a dream, but man, I I don't even I can't put this in the words that I get to be here wearing this, wearing these colors and this. I mean, it, it's been the craziest year of my life, and uh, I I'm just eternally grateful. You more than anyone probably in this room I know and understand what it means to the fans. It does. <laughs> oh man. It's cool, man. It's cool, dude. <laughs> and we were soaking wet, pouring champagne on one another, and, and already drinking more than our fair share. By the time we spill, spilled outside, and my wife and family were outside with a, with a number of other people, so you know, dragged them in and, and you know, made them a part of it. And it went on. To, we were. I, I, we, we, it was well after midnight before we left. And because the fireworks show still had to happen. And right. I don't, I can't honestly tell you that it did. I don't remember <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. Hey guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. And I'm sitting down because I got some big news. Usually I'm standing up to do comedy, but I'm sitting down now because I got the deal of a lifetime. First of all, sitting is bad for you. We all know that. Whether we're sitting on planes or sitting on a beanbag chair watching porn in front of our kids, there's just too much damage you do on the body. Thankfully, Axion has come up with a chair that allows your pelvis to move the way it does while you walk. So all 33 vertebrae align into perfect posture. The result? Better breathing, better blood flow, and relief from the pain. It's crazy what you can do when you set your body to do it. Now, these guys are homies of mine. My buddy Dennis uh, worked with the Clippers as their doctor for 27 years. He runs a wellness center called Peak Wellness. He's a fucking gangster and has uh, saved me from surgery numerous times. Uh, I actually met Justin Bieber at his place. Um, and uh, and I was in my boxers getting cupping done. And Bieber and I locked eyes. And I was like, this is how we were supposed to meet. And Bieber smiled and I never saw him again. Um, but uh, this chair is a game changer. It's changed the way I live. It's changed the way I breathe, the way I sit. And you guys right now can get that chair for 25% off. Uh, using the promo code ALN25 at all33.com. Go to all33.com and use promo code ALN25 for 25% off this chair. It's incredible. You got to get it. It's the only chair out there to get. We will be getting them for the studio, but don't take my word for it. Check out this video. At All33, we've always pushed to reimagine the way we work. That's why we designed our revolutionary sit-in-motion technology to help people perform and feel their best. Then all of a sudden, the whole world was free to rethink how we work and especially where we work. And as Americans came home, so did we. We approached the design of our chairs with a person and planet-first mindset. That's why we chose to build them here in the United States. Manufacturing in the U.S. means we're able to have eyes on every step of the process. From material sourcing, to part production, to testing, even shipping. And we're able to recycle materials, use less energy, and reduce our carbon footprint. We've built the healthiest chairs you will ever sit in to keep you and the world moving. Because movement makes things happen. You guys all went to the clubhouse, right? Got your 
shirts and celebrated, and then and then everybody came back out. Yeah. Is that because yeah. somebody said, "Hey, fans are still here"? Or no, because the guys' families were out here, right. so they, they were coming out one way or the other, and you know, not until. The, all of the, the the initial wave of of kind of celebration, the hugs, the fun, the pouring champagne over everybody. Uh, I don't know who it was, but somebody came in and said, "You are not going to believe how many people are still out there." And you know that's when everybody started to spill back out. And and, and the same thing, much smaller scale, but the same thing happened to us in Toronto when we were celebrating there. You know the the number of Mariners fans that were in Toronto and that stuck around waiting for the clubhouse celebration to be over until we spilled out on the field was just phenomenal. Yeah, I saw a video of you, uh, I think, with a uh, cocktail in hand and fans down near the dugout, oh, it, just thanking you and. Oh no, it went right up in the stands <laughs> with them. You know, it just got up there and and uh, you know actually. The, there was, it was pretty funny. One guy had on a like a, a Mariners, uh, like what I would call like a, a, a splashy Hawaiian shirt <laughs> with all these Mariners logos on it. Awesome. And and I said that's a sweet shirt. And and, and he said to me, uh, he said you want it? I said no no no, you keep it. He goes I like yours. And then we have one of those th- those Rise October. Yeah. You know. And I just took the shirt off and I handed it to him. I said here you take it. And and that guy uh, who you know he, he was in Toronto. I, 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 yeah. But he was wearing a Mariners shirt. He recently sent me like a, a greeting card, like a note congratulating us on the season and, and mailed me his shirt. He said, I figured I would clean mine because I'm never going to clean the one you gave me because it was just soaked with champagne. I just gave him the shirt that we That's were wearing. That's unbelievable, so, dude. That's yeah, pretty cool. How quickly does the celebration when it dies down? And first of all, Scott's, I mean, how great was that on the field? I mean, is that like, again, your relationship, we didn't get to touch on this too much last time, but I, I want you to speak to that a little bit because of what you guys went through in Anaheim, coming here together, building it up together. It truly, I feel like, is a rarity in sports to have you guys being at the helm, but having your, uh, just just going through this much together, I feel like is rare, right? Truly is, you know, and, and in his case, we, we were actually teammates. That's we right. played together. That's right, it goes the, back even further. Yeah, it goes back to my final year as a player. We were teammates then. We played, each, we played against each other throughout the 90s. So, I've, you know, I've known Scott a long, long time. And, you know, Scott, myself, Manny Acta are, were the, the three people, you know, in our baseball group who've been here from the very start. Uh, you know, I, I, I started, Scott came in, Andy McKay joined shortly thereafter. Uh, Manny Acta was the first coach we hired. And, and uh, you know, that there's, we had a little celebration we toasted with a, with a shot. You know, we had, we had this, the, the, a, a tradition was born last year. So this is 2021. Uh, we, we started a tradition of after a win, we would go down and everybody had little championship cups, you know, and, and the championship cup is, it's, it's bigger than a thimble. <laughs> it's, it's about the size of a shot glass. Right. And we would hold our championship cups, you know, like the loving cup. And we, we had fireball and, uh, right. we would just pour these fireball shots. Yeah. And it started with our coaches and, uh, you know, and, and the coaches, you know, it kind of it it it, it kind of started to bleed out into you know our advanced scouting team and the analysts who would be downstairs, and then Justin and I would go down there and join. Well, before too long, now we got a couple of owners that are down there, and it's and it became a thing, and and everybody had so much fun with it, and and just like the the on field dance, you know, the, the celebration yeah. dance after a win, we started doing this 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 shot a fireball and and it started out with six or eight people and it grew to about 25 at, at its height and and I, I i think we were in yankee stadium uh and this was you know the, we, we we win the game it was luis castillo's debut wow. with the with the mariners yes. and uh and afterward we're doing the, the the fireball shot and and the rock happens to walk in and he sees the, like this is happening in the coach's room and he sees it in the coach's room he just thought it was the coolest thing and he said come on i want to do it and so <laughs> he, he takes the little the little thimble and he starts jumping so from that point on it became a celebration with the coaches and the the support group and luis castillo and and he would come in and stand in the middle of the group and and on you know, the the way we used to start it was scott would come in and make a toast to that game whatever happened in that game mm-hmm. You know, and once once the the rock started to take part, Scott would do his toast, and it was slightly less entertaining than it was at home plate sure. after we clinched. But but uh, he would go through his his presentation. You know, guys, that was a hell of a win, and he'd tell you why. And you know, and then once we got Castillo, you knew it was time for the for the the drink. He'd come in and go, you know. 
And then everybody would start to the, the, the the take their, shart, their, their shot and start Amazing. jumping up and down. So you guys are both very well-spoken and articulate. And, uh, and even with a couple of uh, beverages in them, it was, uh, it was, I don't know if it was much needed, but it was like, you know, and those clips went viral too. And I remember watching so many different angles um, of them afterwards. But like, it was milk, you know, we were just milking the experience, which I felt like was awesome because- It was real, yeah. you know, it was real. Big Duffer, yes! Just want to say a few things on behalf of the team. This has been some kind of season. It has been a long time. Thank you to everybody that is here tonight and every Mariners fan in the Pacific Northwest. You brought the electricity tonight to this building, and it was unbelievable. You have made a difference with this team, and I thank you. When Jerry and I came here seven years ago, we had a goal. We needed the end the effing drought. We did it. These players behind me are special. They care. They care about playing the game the right way. And they care about re representing the city of Seattle because of you. Every day when the game starts, I look up those banners. We need to add another one. Yes, we've ended the drought. This team's just starting. We've got big games ahead of us, and we're going to need you with us. But for tonight, let's party! And the drought, when you really, like, break it down, it's like, again, the stakes of the game, how it happened. Full count, two outs, bottom of the ninth. It's bottom of the ninth, right? Uh, the bottom of the tenth. Oh, no, it was tenth. Tenth, yeah. that's right. Um, but the the everything that was at stake, it was like, yeah, of course, like you should. People should not have to leave until they want to leave. And for the team to come back out and Scott to really, it was heartfelt too. And it was uh, you could see, uh, and and I want you to speak to that, like your guys's day to day and what you've you know put so much time into building and to have it happen like that. Um, uh, is there something you got? Like, do you guys have like a moment together? Did you text the next day, just like I fucking can't believe this, or is it like? Once you celebrate, is it like, now let's back to business? Oh, no. The next day, we actually, because it's baseball. Played. You know, you come back and you <laughs> okay. play. Yeah. yeah. We, we came back out the next day, and we had a day game, and it happened to be the day that we were, we were, it, it was, so a day game, it was well into the, the, the morning hours. You guys before, party for a while. Yeah. It went, yeah. it went on for a good while. Awesome. And then, and, and then there were a couple of our players who showed up the next morning at eight o'clock. And I'm thinking, I, I know I just saw you looking <laughs> at it. And it, they were gamers. They showed up and they were ready to go. And we gave most of the regulars a day off, but we were doing our presentations for our minor league uh, award winners, you know, our minor league player of the year, pitcher of the year. And, you know, think about this. 
our minor league players, they go out and they play 144 game schedule. Mm-hmm. They're in places like Arkansas and you know Modesto, California, yeah. and they're not particularly close to Seattle. And they're here for one night. The award winners are here for one night, and that was their night. Get is, the is, out of they're here. here for that night, and their families are with them, and and uh, and and they get to to get a live taste. that experience and. Mm. And, uh, you know, they're, the, the excitement that they feel. So now it's the, it's, it's Harry Ford and it's, it, it's the, 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 like the next generation of Mariner player. They're all sitting there and they're watching this and, and, uh, and they come out on the field on Saturday for the awards presentation and the rest of us look like, you know, <laughs> we just got dragged in from the street. And, and, uh, and I, and I thought to myself, you know, of all the years we've done this, that group of, of young players is walking out of here thinking, wow, what an awesome place this is. Be, it's a, in years past, you get here on, on minor league awards presentation day and there's a crowd of, you know, 11,000 people that are generally going to be kind with their applause to come here on the day where you've got 48,000 people screaming like crazy who refuse to leave the ballpark. And it, I mean, what a moment for all those young guys. Can't put a price on that motivation nope. for them. Yeah, That's yeah, so you can't make it up. Either. Insane. Um, it wound up becoming a very good little short film that we've shown the free agents that we're trying to. to oh, you do that. That's a oh yeah, a yeah. press uh, kit tool. Yeah, yeah. So just the same way that I'll send a a reel, you know, for for any sort of acting gig or whatnot. You guys do that for trying to get people to come here. Absolutely, and it's a and and Is some Riz cases. Narrated? Uh, you know, Riz narrated our Shohei Otani presentation cool. back in the day, and and uh, which was fab. He does an awesome job. It's unreal. Uh, now the one we did this year was just taking it was it was naturally easy because there were so many highlights that included Riz and Dave Sims and Aaron Goldsmith. You know, we were able to to drum something up and just piece them back to back together. And it's uh it's 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 pretty awesome. Um all right, Toronto, the vibe there. Uh obviously, let's just go right to the uh the the clinching game or or talk me through just the opening of the series. Nerves, excited. Do you almost feel and, and you would hear people talk about like just clinching was enough. Was that the? Um, that, that, there's no way that was the uh, the sentiment. It was like we can beat anybody. We we thought we could beat anybody, and you know, as it works out, the we got on the 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 side of the bracket that nobody really wanted to be on, having to play in Toronto and then in Houston, and you know, oddly enough, we felt like we were a good matchup with the Blue Jays because we you know we can generally shut down right-handed hitting, yeah. and they were very right-handed. And it's it's part of the reason why we as as we started that 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 it's a three game series. If that game if that is a seven game series with the, their offense, maybe it's a different story. I don't know, but we thought you know facing a right handed heavy lineup with the pitching that we can run out there, we felt like we were going to be okay. So we planned that series. You know, like we are winning this series. How do we plan the Astros series to give us ourselves the best chance to win? And wow. and that's how we laid out our pitching. And you know, it ultimately it didn't quite work as we had hoped. But we thought that the best chance that we had of winning is if we set up Logan Gilbert to start series two. And mm-hmm. and uh, you know we were willing to roll the dice that that meant we we first had to get through series one. And, uh, Maybe the part we didn't expect was having to use George Kirby to close out the, the final which game. Which was awesome. Yeah, was that great. was some big unit 95 shit. Here's the stretch and the Kirby. Oh, two pitch to Tappy on the way. Swinging a fly ball center field. Coming in Julio. He makes the catch and the ball game is over. The Mariners win the wild card series. They're going to Houston to take on the Astros in one of the most incredible, miraculous finishes and comebacks we have ever seen. The Mariners celebrate with a two-game sweep over the Blue Jays here in Toronto. The Mariners win it. A final score of 10-9. to The guys doing their happy dance. And guess what? Not only are the Mariners taking this series to Houston, that series will take the series Back to you, fans in Seattle. He's just awesome. coming out like yeah. no unflappable, nerves. and he has them. He's just able to manage it. And it's uh, he's just such a cool. My, my wife, we were walking back from workout day at uh, at Rogers Center, and uh, and just so happened that that Kirby was walking back with us, and and 
my wife Tammy, she had never met George. And as we're walking back to the hotel, you know, he's he's just talking about the way the final month has gone, the season, how he feels going into the postseason. That you know, we we talked a lot about his innings, mm-hmm. etc. And then just his family and the experience that, of going through this in his first year. And you know, he broke off to to go one way, and Tammy and I went back to to get a cup of coffee. And uh, and as soon as he turned and walked away, she said, "Wow, is he some kind of composed?" And, and I said, "Oh yeah, it's, it jumps right off the page." You look so comfortable in the big leagues. Appreciate that. Thanks for having me on too. Um, yeah, you know, I've been just working super hard. Um, out of that sinker into my arsenal, it's been it's been a great pitch for me. Uh, just getting guys super uncomfortable, and uh, I've been just filling it up. Uh, it's the name of the game. At that age, that's crazy. Yeah. It, it is. It does translate off the field, right? And whatever it is that he takes on, he's just good at that thing. Yeah. Whatever it is, it, it could be ping pong or pool or throwing 100 mile an hour baseballs. Uh, take me through your emotions of the uh, of clinching that game. I mean, I'm backstage at a show in Peoria, Illinois, listening. To, I mean, I mean, like nine different group texts. Like the the com- It was. Um, were you prepping like I think like most of us were for Game Three? There's that game seemed so out of our grasp yeah. at one point. And, you know, knowing that the Blue Jays can can rattle off a half a dozen runs with anybody, you know, when we got so far down in that game, you didn't think there was a snowball's chance. And and here they come. They just started doing it. And, the, and then, you know, crazy stuff started happening and the blooper falls in. And you know, energy the, shift in the stadium. There's, you, feel- you can feel it. And, and the fans could feel it. And the, the first thing that, that I thought of, I, I turned around to Justin. I said, we're going to win this game. Oh, and, then, shit. and, you know, it's a, that that's you know, and then JP hit the ball that got caught up there in the triangle. And, you know, the they, exact perfect spot. Yeah. The guys are crashing into one another. Two outs. It's, it's amazing. And, and that's how, you know, that kind of magic is, you know, first of all, it made it all the more enjoyable mm-hmm. jumping around and, oh, yeah. and having the fun downstairs. But if you the, the craziness that is like going in and winning that game in Toronto, uh, you know, in game two, going into Houston and the way game one ended for us. And then, you know, the even crazier, the, the 18 inning game when we came back to Seattle, we, we may Stand not up. have made it to the World Series, but Bro. we had an epic trip through the postseason. Oh, yeah. The ultimate highs and lows. Yeah. Really well, cool. Well, speak to that, too, because so once you win in uh, Toronto, I mean, again, is it just another like, holy shit, like this is, do you, is it? Uh, you know, can you get ahead of yourself and go, wow, the magic uh, carpet might be uh, just going to carry us through until the end because of the way this game just went? I think we all believe, yeah. you know, and, and our players more than anyone else, our players believe. Uh, there's there's something about being super young and being extremely talented. There's You don't know what you're incapable of. You know, you just go out and you do it. And and I think the, you know, the, from the pundits, you know, the, the national media attention that was paid to our series with the Astros were roughly, this is going to be a massacre. This team has no chance. Yeah. And, and uh, you know. The, you guys are paying attention to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the guys kind of took it and ran with it. Like there's. They play, we have played the Astros so many times through the years. We have had such a tough time in Houston that I think there was just a, a, a general, screw it, let's just go out and do what we do. And and the one thing that was kind of on everybody's, you know, the, the, the tip of their tongue was they've never seen the version of us that has this version of Julio and The Rock. You know, and they never have because we finished playing the Astros so early in our season. Yeah. They didn't see Luis Castillo. You know, they, they had seen a good version of Julio, but they didn't see what Julio kind of evolved into as the season drifted along because we, our, our schedule is so front loaded with the Astros. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then lo and behold, you know, that, that was as that game started, it was about Luis Castillo. And then here comes the offense and they pour it on Verlander early. And, and we were doing things that we don't do in Houston because they, they turned, we turned into a different team. The mentality shifted. Hey, they've never seen this version of us. We got them. And- it, 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 the emotional um, from Toronto to then how game one ended, you know, and uh, I, I feel like both you guys spoke about it, you and Scott, of like, hey, man, it's fucking baseball. Right. Shit happens. The highs and lows. Like, we're playing again tomorrow. So it's like you... You know, and it almost feels like easier said than done uh, coming off a, a, a game like that where you're like, because some people idiotically, and it might have been uh, <laughs> Russo, you know, the series is over. You can't come back from that win. That's a game that's, that you should have had it. You didn't get it. 
But I'm like, it's one fucking game. Yeah. It's a long yeah. series. What is the? I was with the Red Sox in in 2004. Yeah. And anything can happen, you know. Is uh, how much though? And maybe you can speak from your perspective and in, in the clubhouse. Does um, uh, the, the you know emotional up and down from Toronto to that can it like take it out of you a little bit? A little bit, but it didn't. It, I, we should have won the next game too. Right. And you know it, our guys show up every day, and and they just they keep fighting. You get conditioned it, to just wipe it away, right? Yeah, and we, th- that's just the personality of our team. They yeah. grind, and and they know that's their personality. They're grinders, and and they showed up the next day, and they knew it was a. It, it, it was just a freak thing, you know, and and uh, that does happen in baseball. And we we showed up the next day, and we should have won that one too. Yeah. And and it's just a freak thing. And if you look back in that series, and this is phenomenal, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. We played thirty six innings in that in that three games, thirty six innings in the three game series, which by itself is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. The Astros led for four innings and in thirty six, and we got swept, which is almost impossible to do. But, you know, it gave the guys that we got swept, which by itself means we didn't get to move on. They did. But what, what the, the, the result of our being in there is that they now believe and, and our team believes that we can go out there and beat them. And, and I think by the end of it, and there were other teams in baseball that made this observation. There's the, you guys may have been the next best team in baseball the, the, when that series was going on sure. with the Astros. Nobody yeah. else gave them a run like yeah. that after that. All right, so you come home for the uh, the first uh, home playoff game in 20-some years. Bonkers. I mean, just yeah, energy crazy. times 10 from the uh, big dumper night. From the get-go. And, and came in, and this is the we, you told me to pin the, you know, the Felix throwing out the first pitch. Yeah. You know, that was something that had been in the works for a couple of weeks. And and none of us ha- have seen Felix since his last day with the, with the Mariners. Wow. And, you know, periodically, you know, someone, you know, you know Franklin Gutierrez might, might get a, a text or sure. have a conversation with him. But by and large, none of us have, have had much conversation with, with Felix. He went off the grid, moved back to Miami. And, uh, you know, when he agreed to come out and do it, it was a pretty cool thing. And you knew that that would be a good kickoff. And, and I hope, I wish it would have happened with, you know, a, a one-to-one series or a two-to-zero rather right. than, the, than down 0-2. Right. But when he walked out and I saw the, the way the fans reacted and, and, you know, his involvement. But I flash back when I got to the ballpark, you know, it, I, I walked into my office or up into the office spaces. And, and uh, immediately when I walked up, I, I said, and I, and I, I, I said, I said, I think I smell a Felix because it, he is unmistakable. He's one of the best smelling players that's awesome. ever played. What does you he know? wear? I, I don't know what it is, but it's just this magical. It's, the it's, musk. it's like the Kavorka. <laughs> it, 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 it drags you in. And, and, uh, you know, I walked around the corner and saw he and his brother and, and, uh, talked to him for a little while. And then the way the fans kind of embraced him. I don't know. I, I don't think he was prepared for that. I don't know that he was ready to, to, to be loved that way. Also and he's a, he's he he loves he's he, he has more he believes uh, Seattle. He, he does and he's he he can engage the crowd like no other player ever totally around. you know it's a he's got that theatric I you know
Welcome back, Felix. Welcome back, Goody. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Oh, his pitching out. Yeah, the yeah. way he would like, I mean, with his, his core. Like, yeah, dude, really. Fans love to have the fourth wall broken and to be connected like that. I mean, it's uh, especially with pitchers. Um, also, probably the closest thing to pitching a playoff game, right? To yep. be on the mound for a playoff game. I mean, in that moment, which yeah. is it, you know, we couldn't really deliver it for him through his years playing, and, and he, but he got to experience it in a different way. So the dumper walk-off, greatest uh, baseball moment, but the 18-inning game, um, I was up here for because we were planning to go to um, the, next, uh, the next game. The most exciting, as obviously gut-wrenching as a finish as you could ask for, um, but the way that the, the bullpen came through, and every inning had... Moments where it was like, fuck, dude, how do we get out of this? And then the yeah. drama. And I can only imagine again what it felt like. And I'm just trying to like think of some, I mean, some certain brash at bats were crazy, but like it just seemed like one after the other, guys coming in throwing the best stuff they've ever thrown yeah. um, and, uh, and getting out of it to where you're just like, there's no way we're losing this. Two on and two outs. And they are going to pitch to Altuve. Swing and a miss and a slider. He got him. Strike three. That will retire the side. Holy smokes. What a performance by Matt Brash. And the Astros leave two runners stranded in scoring position. And it was going to be tough to come back from down, you know, two games and, yeah. and, and, a, and a shorter series. But the ball that Julio hit like 7,000 miles an hour off the left field wall, that, that ball's a foot from being a homer and the game's over and we never go that far. And, you know, and, and I can't tell you that our pitching is lined up any better than their pitching because their pitching staff is as deep as I've ever seen. Crazy. It's just crazy deep. But, you know, to get to, to win that game at home, you know, and, and have that type of momentum on your side, because I guys truly believe that we, we should have won the first two games. And, yeah. you know, to have that kind of momentum, that's when crazy stuff happens. Yeah. And, and, you know, especially when you have your home fans on your side and, and our fans are relentless in the way they get after the Astros when they're here. Oh, yeah. So, which is, you know, the whole thing is kind of fun. From the whole experience, did you take dirt from Toronto? Did you take a... Oh, yeah. A, a, you did. Because I know, and Goobs just told me this, so I want to talk about it for, for a, a few. Your baseball memorabilia side of you did not know. You have a door, he said, that, like, people yeah. have signed. Like, just to take us through the museum of uh, what so you got. I did not personally grab the dirt, but uh, our director of, of team travel, Jack Mossman, is a... Awesome guy, and and he he was thoughtful enough. Jack is is one of the the creators of the the fireball moment. Uh, he was thoughtful enough to go out and he grabbed a ton of dirt at you know both clinches awesome. here at home and then in Toronto, and uh, and he took mini bottles of fireball, filled them all up, and dated them, you know, and uh, incredible, which was great. Uh, he also made sure that everybody got a, a certified game used ball from the the clinching games and. Uh, you know, the Major League Baseball authenticators oh, you know, yeah. tag them and sign off on them. So you geek out about that stuff, yeah. Uh, there's it. It means something to me. You know, you know, Scott gave me the lineup card from the the clinching game to hang on the wall in my office, cool. which is you know, with, with all the nicknames and the fun stuff, and which I thought was again really cool. But I've been the baseball memorabilia for since I was a kid. You know, I started out like a lot of kids collecting baseball cards, and it. it kind of grew into something bigger as I became like worked my way into adulthood. And then when I started playing and you start meeting all your heroes and, and, and I think I may have told you this story. Yeah. The, the first time I encountered Tom Seaver. Right. Uh, that day, it was a, early in my very first year in the big leagues. And, and now you're seeing I'm like, oh my gosh, there's, there's George Brett. That's Tom Seaver. There's Nolan Ryan. And, and you're around all these guys. And, you know, and I had a pretty big, like, baseball card collection, had some signed balls, things like that. But then I just went over, over the top. And, and we had, you know, by the time I finished playing, we had, like, a museum in the basement of my house. And, and when, you know, we, I, I collected, like, real antique stuff, like mm -hmm. the uh, uh, autographs of, of long-deceased Hall of Famers, you know, signed contracts from, you know, the great players of all time from when they were, you know, in their heyday in the 20s and things wow. like that. But, uh, you know, signed baseballs from luminaries like Walter Johnson or Babe Ruth, things like that, you know, like the Sandlot ball. Yeah. 
and uh, you know some awards that that you know you, you're able to to, to pull pull out and and uh, during my last couple of years as a player, as guys we, I played for the Rockies in Denver, and as guys would come through Denver, you know three or four from a team or two coaches and a player, you know they'd want to come over and see the the collection. So you know Don Baylor, who was my manager in Colorado for a number of years had since moved on i think he was with the braves at the time as a hitting coach and he came through and he brought a couple of braves coaches and and frank robinson out to the house uh and if there's frank was in a tweener he, he wasn't managing at the yeah. time and uh they come out to the house and 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 Groove, we call Don Baylor Groove. Groove looks up at the walls and he goes, he said, JD, you got no more room for anything on the walls. We, you have to have people start signing in between the the, the pictures. And uh, and I said, there's always the doors because we had there were doors leading to like the water heater space yeah. or to a bathroom. And so, you know, from that moment on, guys started signing and leaving messages on the doors and then they would sign off on it. So, you know, like, uh, you know, there's, I remember a couple of the messages that that, that were first went up, you know, like uh, JD love, uh, you got a lot of balls, you know, something like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then, and uh, and they would just sign these doors, and and that was, you know, I, I retired a couple of years later, and we moved from Denver to Kansas City, back to Denver again, from Denver back to or to Arizona, mm -hmm. and we kept moving. So every time we'd move, we would just take the doors down and take the doors with us, and. You know, and at a certain point, they didn't make sense anymore because there was no more collection around them. Yeah. You know, it was a, the, as houses got smaller, the collection had to get condensed. Right. And, and, uh, but it was so fun while we were doing it. My uh, buddy Bob Stelton, who hosts Wyman and Bob on ESPN 710, said he told me to ask you about, I think it was during your playing days, I don't know if it was a superstition with a Nolan Ryan card in the jock strap? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it's that a real story? Real story, yeah. I was, I was a kid, actually. There was, so I was in college. And th this, I wouldn't try this, uh, as a, <laughs> like to do it now. But throughout my my time in college, I, I never wore a cup, so I, I pitched with no cup. And, Bold move, by the way. Yeah, which seems stupid, and and now I look back on it thinking, <laughs> what an idiot, right? But uh, but I I kept a Nolan Ryan baseball card tucked in the little pocket of my jock, and I said, don't worry, the boys are getting protected by Nolan. <laughs> and, and uh, I've seen him punch Robin Ventura. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> there's so so this was you know this was in the 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 this is 1986 to 89 and I, and I wore this 1972 Nolan Ryan baseball card in my jock and was it in a case? Is that why you no, were so protected? No, it was just in there and the, the, no it, sleeve, just no, by itself. Just a, just a card. Just in there. Nolan's face, just getting teabagged by Depoto. That's right. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they so, and and that year, you know, I had a pretty good year. My my sophomore year in college, I I did some good things, and Baseball America got a load of the fact that I wore this this card in my jock, and that's and they wrote a story about it. Please tell me Nolan has gotten wind of this. Oh, he's aware. Yeah, he was aware. I said, later on, you know, I met him when when I yeah. got to the the big leagues. Not too long after that, actually, and I, and I we're. Old Texas State and old Arlington yeah, Stadium. Yeah. This isn't so. Now they're at the, the the new Taj Mahal. Previously, they were at the ballpark in Arlington. The one before that, which was the original ballpark in Arlington, is is where I first got to the big leagues, and that was the spot, right? And and uh, you know, first time I was ever in there, I asked if I could meet Nolan Ryan. So I asked our traveling secretary, Mike Seggy. I said, Seg, is there any chance I can meet Nolan Ryan? He goes, Yeah, we'll take care of it. So they take me out, you know, this old ballpark, you would walk out of the clubhouse and you're just standing in a parking lot. You know, like now it's all security and you you would walk out and you're in like a gravel parking lot. Yeah. And we and the, the way the clubhouses were set up, you know, our you shared a common gravel parking lot. So he takes me out into this gravel parking lot and Nolan Ryan is sitting on a milk crate signing all of the, the 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 things that guys like me would send over to have Nolan Ryan sign. It was and it's like this pallet of stuff that was driven over there, balls and photos and, and like hundreds of items. And he's just sitting there on the second day of every homestand, he'd just sign all this Amazing. stuff away. And uh, you know, he and I sat there and I talked with him for about a half an hour. I told him, you know, about the the baseball card thing. <laughs> How do you react? Uh, probably about as <laughs> as down the middle as you can react. <laughs> He, he, he really doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, by the way, appropriate. That sounds kind of crazy to me. You know, something. <laughs> and uh, 
We, that I night, Bobby Bonilla, my bunk <laughs> rat, so I get it. You know, yeah. He go, he goes. Uh, that night, I go out there and pitch against the Rangers, and it's about the best stuff that I can remember having in a in a big league game. Awesome. And, and uh, it's like it, I wind up getting a save, and the next day I'm out there doing my running, and and Nolan's duck walking across the outfield doing his walking striders that he did every day, and he, he gets up on top of me, and this is after talking with me the night before on the the uh, the milk bucket or the the milk crate. He, uh, he said, threw the ball good last night. Keep doing that. You can be in this league a long time. And this is, again, it's before cell phones. That ballpark in Arlington is one deck. There is no upper deck, which is laughable now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I ran up the steps of the, the, the one, you know, yeah. lower bowl, lower yeah. tier onto the concourse. And I grabbed a payphone. I collect call my dad. And I said, you are not going to believe what Nolan Ryan just said to me. And I, and the, like, I was the original like geek kid that just happened to, to make it to the big leagues and, and play. And, and it became, you know, it, I, I, I enjoyed every single minute of it. Never took for granted the, 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 the magic that, that is being a, a big leaguer. It's, it's phenomenal. That's insane. Uh, and what's cool now is like, you know, you've created, as we wrap this up, I mean, an ambiance now and uh, culture uh, with the organization in the city where it's like those types of moments are happening for yeah. our players, but also like the the, the stuff and how uh, uh, generous the players are and you guys are with the community. It's like when the team is good and, and, and there's so much more potential and excitement <clears throat> going into the next season, that's what I want to wrap up on is, is uh, your thoughts about going into the next season. But it's like it, it's way the amount of kids that probably know now every player on the yeah. team. Like Haggerty is not like is probably he swags. He's, swag. a, he's, he's a dude. Probably yeah. many kids' favorite player because Julio is such an obvious choice. And it's like, but you know what I'm saying? We have now a cast of characters where it's like, you know, your uh, people get you know France jerseys and um, and and Suarez. You know, it's like every there's somebody for everybody, which is very cool. Uh, I have my Airbnb already locked in for uh, a weekend in spring training, um, so uh, I'll see you down there again. What is going forward to um, 2023 as we wrap up here? Um, just kind of your um, your uh, your place right now. Where where is your head at going into? And I guess what are you most excited about for next season? There's what this team looks like with another year under its belt. You know, it's this. We still have one of the youngest teams in the league, and and the the core players for you know Julio is going to be 22. It's a George Kirby's going to be 25, as will Cal Raleigh, and you know it, it, Logan Gilbert's going to be 26 years old. Like the, the, we've not even gotten to the point where the, the you know the, the the core of this team is is even to what would traditionally be called your prime years, mm. and they're already so good. Yeah. And, and you know we've got I think a healthy season from Ty France. So, you know what what we can do with uh, just learning one more year about this this group, and then what we can add to them. You know we still have a couple of months where we can you know the, what does Teo look like in the middle of that batting order? Can we find another one just like him and and add it between now and then? Uh, ideally, that that could be someone who plays second base for us. Right. But you know as it. As it goes, just fine. What I see or, or envision with this team is just sustaining. And I, this, it may not sound sexy, but you know, what the Braves were able to this. do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a, what the Braves were able to do yeah. for like 16 straight years. Our goal is to bite the apple as many times as we can. Because if, if we're consistently in a position to take a bite at that postseason apple, there's, you got to be pretty unlucky to only win one in 16. You know, it's a, there's when you're that good. And, you know, our general take is that, that if we are just constantly in that postseason dance and we just keep getting our bite, you know, we're going to win our fair share. Are you pumped for spring training with this amount of, because not every team gets to enjoy what we just enjoyed and know what we have to look forward to on top of the all-star game being here, which I feel like is a good omen just from yeah. 2001. So are you like genuinely like pumped to get to Arizona and be around just like the whole atmosphere? I, I, I yeah. always am. You yeah. know, it's, a, it's, it's funny. You know, you said with the, the winning, our players are, are terrific. If we're winning or we're losing, they're awesome in the community. There's similarly, you go to spring training and I'd, I'd like to, I, I would be lying if I told you, even in years where you go to spring training, you know, it's a pretty you know, bleak out, right. you know, outlook for your season. You still go to spring training in that first day. You're like, we are going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, you're, you're watching guys throw in that first bullpen thing. Oh, he did his work. And then yes. two weeks later, you're like, whew. <laughs> 
There's, it's, but it's such an exciting time to be yeah. there. And, and we do have, we, we have so much to look forward to. We have uh, this group of players who we have, those who aren't here yet, who will be added to this group. And then there's another young wave that's coming. And, and that's how this thing was built is, is by trusting your young players. And we're going to continue to do that. There's a lot of talent yet to come. Um, this was amazing. Guys, Jerry DePoto, give it up. That's it. A, a living legend. Um, thanks for making time again. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully, I think I texted you our record after my first pitch. I think it was like 23 and 6. Guess who's so. throwing out the first pitch on opening day? Who? <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> yeah. Do we have that? Yeah. No, I think there's probably, uh, you know, see if Steve Poole is available. Do you know who Steve Poole is? I don't. He's um, the, uh, I think he's still re- retired. He might be, but he was the weatherman here for Como News 4. Um, when uh, when I was a kid, so yeah, he's probably there's a good reason you don't know who he is. First celebrity I ever met, though. But why would he throw out our first pitch? Exactly, dude. Thank <laughs> you. That's all I needed on tape, <laughs> just in case Pool is being brought up in conversation and it's Pool versus Ray. We're gonna isolate that audio. God, and that's how they'll go with me. He was the first celebrity I ever met at the Seattle Aquarium, and he had a headshot on him. And I go, Steve Pool. I had the balls in the fifth grade to go, Steve Pool. You know, you're you know you're cool or whatever. I said to a you know I don't know. I was geeking out. And a little bit nervous. And he took out a headshot. He goes, you want a picture? And I was like, I didn't know how to say no. Because even in that moment as a kid, I was like, this is very awkward that you are that you have a picture <laughs> you of yourself. Just know. And you yeah. just know. And you assume that that's what I want. All I really wanted was a little bit of eye contact. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, so, so I had a teammate who used to walk around with his baseball cards in a, in a little thing in his pocket. You know, And it, if it meets somebody, oh, yeah, let me give you a card. And he would just give him a baseball card. Not thought, mad about that. Yeah, I'd say there's kind of douchey. I, it's a little douchey, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, but I, I've, I've never forgotten it. That's 30 years ago. Who's the still, guy? Yeah, I, I say it off air. I, yeah, it was what? Wally Joyner. No, because <laughs> uh, that, that move is like you know, again, you're you want to be prepared for the moment, like whether because that's it's a big deal for them, and it takes very little off you to have cards in your pocket. But there you go. Yeah, it's yeah. for you. <laughs> Take it home. Get have it. you ever done the uh, where people are uh, waving and it's the person behind you and you intercept the wave? Oh, that, that is, it's that moment. I have yeah. had that moment. Yeah, <sighs> sucks. Actually, that moment may have happened to me in the last week or so in our own dining room. Like, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, but I just uh, ended the drought. But I thought you were. Yeah, I was trying to, yeah. Um, you're the man. Thanks for Appreciate making time, you, dude. Thank you're you. the best. garage the sawdust that pine saw in the moss around every spring when the winter thaw we'd huddle around the radio twist the broken knob 7 10 a.m no kjr daily house his voice would echo throughout the yard couldn't have been older than 10 but to me and my friends the voice on the other end might as well have been gods 1995 the division series Eggers up to bat Bottom of the 11th inning Got the whole town listening Swung on and belted The words distorted Joy Core rounds third Here comes Griffey The throw to the place Not in time My oh my The Mariners win it Yes Fireworks They lit up That ceiling In the King Dome We had just made history Here comes Joy Here is Junior to third base There come the waving men The throw to the plate Will be late Mmm, Zoa. Thanks, Rock. Guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. Hope you enjoyed that episode. It was a good one. A lot of laughs, a lot of tears, a lot of uh, stuff to uh, to think about and chew on, huh? Because that's what life's all about, chewing on the good stuff. Nobody said that. Maybe Denzel did. Maybe Tom Hanks did. Maybe they said it together in Philadelphia. The point is, click subscribe right here on the ALN logo so you can get more episodes and stay up to date when new content drops, highlights, animations, clips. It's all here for you, baby. I'll see you next time. Oh, I don't know how to blink.